All right, we're going to start today with the 123rd Psalm. This is a song of ascents. Unto you I lift my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of the servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God, until he has mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us. For we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease, with the contempt of the proud. Heavenly Father, glorious Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the people that have come out here despite this most inclement weather. And I ask that you would uh, just bless each one of them in their hearts and in their souls. And maybe they'll hear something today which will uh, help them to understand you in a more full and, and uh, precious way. And uh, please take good care of them in the week ahead and reward them for their faithfulness despite this weather. Here they are. Just thank you for that. And Lord, um, uh, you know that there are certain prayers that uh, we have on our hearts today, each one of us individually and as a uh, church and a group of people. And I would ask that you would search our hearts and uh, find out those things and look to them and uh, help us to uh, uh, be well in our health, to be uh, filled at our tables and to be ever mindful of our need to praise you and give you the glory that you're due every moment of the day. May our lips just utter praises to you and speak to you with our hearts and with our thoughts that you are ever edified through how we interact with you. Oh God, you're wonderful, you're beautiful, and we thank you above all for the gift of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, I don't have many uh, announcements and I'm not going to uh, get too in-depth with anything prior to the sermon today because obviously it's, it's very gray out here. And uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, we have pine trees above us. It's getting the fog and it's dropping the fog like rain on the people over here. And so uh, uh, they were brave enough to come out and uh, we want to keep it short for them. Um, just a quick few announcements. Um, we're uh, under construction at Superior Avenue and um, hopefully uh, things will be uh, going along pretty soon as far as uh, moving into the building, maybe a month or two. I don't know how long those things take. And um, uh, we decided on a name, it will be the Superior Word because it's Superior Avenue and of course God's Word is superior to all others. So the Superior Word is what we'll call this when we move into that building. And um, anybody here that's never been scripturally baptized, if it's something that you wanna do, we can go out there today or any day of the week. Um, uh, you're kind of getting baptized by the rain anyway, but um, uh, that is available any day of the week I do that. And uh, so if it's something that you feel that you want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, a picture of his death being buried with him in his death and raised to newness of life through the power of the resurrection, we could do that. And um, of course, uh, I'll announce now that next week we're going to have our resurrection day sermon and uh, that'll be coming. Uh, today is Genesis 29 verses 1 through 14. It's exile from the land. It's uh, Jacob leaving the promised land and heading off to uh, Haran. This is our 67th Genesis sermon today. And um, I will not do a New Testament reading. Uh, normally I just read the New Testament and I analyze the verses very uh, briefly. I'm not gonna do that today just for the sake of time and, and uh, you know any in more inclement weather that might come in. But I will go ahead and read a psalm. We'll read uh, one more psalm before we get started into our normal weekly activities. And uh, this will be the 124th psalm. Hello. Uh, this is Psalm 124. It's a song of ascents of David. If it had not been the Lord, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. Then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as a prey to their teeth, or our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Wonderful words from the Lord. And um, one more thing that I wanted to say, uh, I'm kind of skipping around today, but uh, as far as our announcements is we have Paul over here, who uh, he and Elaine just got back from Japan after being missionaries for a year. And it's time to have somebody tinker with his ticker. And uh, this week on the 28th, I would ask that you would remember him in prayer. He's gonna have two valves replaced and one worked on. And uh, it's nothing ever to take lightly, although he is in the Lord's hands and we know that and uh, all things happen according to the good purpose and will of the Lord, including 
is uh, total healing and restoration and coming back to uh, be a part of the church here shortly. And prayers for her, Elaine, who, although is the most calm person I think I know in the world, I know somewhere deep inside where she's feeling the, the stress of the moment as well. So uh, please keep them in uh, prayer. And um, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, move on from there with our uh, sermon. Today is Genesis 29, verses 1 through 14. And uh, as I do each week before we do the sermon, I do a, uh, a little uh, short uh, evaluation of this day in history. And today is 24 March. And on this day in uh, 1765, Britain passed the Quartering Act that required the American colonies to house 10,000 British troops in public, public and private houses. So in other words, um, they forcibly moved into uh, the private homes of the American uh, people at that time. And uh, that reminds me, I always carry a copy of the Constitution, and I think I can find this probably pretty quickly. That led to the uh, Fourth Amendment of our um, uh, uh, Constitution. It may be the Third Amendment. And let's see here. Third Amendment. Amendment 3 to the Constitution of the United States. No soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner nor in time of war, but in a manner prescribed by law. There you go, that uh, was the impetus for that, and it was a wise decision that they made. Um, in uh, 1832, Mormon Joseph Smith was beaten tarred and feathered in Ohio. And although I don't know the reason why he was tarred and feathered, maybe it was because uh, uh, he was a troublemaker or something, I don't know, but um, I hope it wasn't because he was a Mormon. In America, we have uh, freedom of uh, religion, However, I would like to remind each person here that um, uh, Mormonism is not Christianity. I'm not a, a basher of other religions. You can believe whatever you want. But more, Mormonism teaches polytheism, and uh, they believe there's more than one God. So it's not a Christian religion, and we need to keep that in our minds as we uh, uh, go deciding on a church to attend. Um, if somebody wants, we got some more uh, picnic tables over here if anybody wants to pull them over. And I apologize, we're completely out of chairs today. But uh, anyway, here, uh, 1837, Canada gave blacks the right to vote. So that was well before our um, Civil War. And it was also um, uh, long before we gave uh, blacks the right to vote in America. So uh, hats off to Canada for that. It's uh, something that... Uh, uh, the Bible never teaches is that people should be suppressed in any way at all. Uh, if you uh, started here in the early Genesis sermons, you would realize that um, God is uh, a, the God of all people. And all people are on a uh, level playing field with the Creator. So uh, I'm very glad to know that Canada did that and they did it well before America. And then in 1878, the British frigate Eurydice sank, killing 300. I don't know anything about the frigate Eurydice, but I do know that 300 people got up that morning and uh, they had no idea that that night or that day they would, uh, you know, go off to glory or go off to condemnation. And uh, it's a lesson that I try to bring in with tragedies like this is none of us know our end. And uh, we could get out on the midnight pass and get hit by a car and die. Or, uh, you know, God forbid a uh, tree branch could fall on one of us today. We do not know. And our lives and our times are in the Lord's hands. And so we need to be aware of this and to uh, remember when we get up in the morning to praise the Lord and throughout each uh, breath we take is to remember the Lord because our day of reckoning is coming. And it was uh, on uh, this day in 1878 that it happened for the sailors of the Eurydice. And uh, 1882 in Berlin, good news, German scientist Robert Koch announced the di discovery of the tuberculosis germ, the bacillus. And uh, that led, of course, to inoculations and uh, uh, tuberculosis or consumption, having uh, killed many, many billions of people, millions or hundreds of millions, possibly billions over the uh, generations. Um, but uh, that's something that was identified in 1882. And then in 1883, the first telephone call on this day was made between New York and Chicago. So uh, we're talking, you know, 140 years ago or so, they were talking on the phone to each other in New York and Chicago. Uh, then in 1898, the first automobile was sold on this day, 24 March. Um, what do we have here? 1900 in New Jersey, the Carnegie Steel Corporation was formed. And uh, that obviously was a uh, great source of American wealth and industry. And uh, American steel has kind of gone the way of the dodo for the most part. But uh, it was something that really established us and helped us grow into a, an industrialized society. 
And, um, and then on this day in 1906, the census of the British Empire revealed that England ruled one fifth of the world, both in land and I believe in population as well. And um, of course they had the, the saying that the sun never set on the uh, British Empire. And uh, that's pretty much all but gone. Uh, they fight now over little islands down off of the uh, coast of Argentina, the Falklands, and uh, they have a presence elsewhere. Of course, uh, the people in Australia and Canada are very tied to the British, but uh, uh, empires rise and empires fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. So um, there you go, 1947, the Congress proposed the limitation of the presidency to two terms. And of course, if you're a big, uh, uh, supporter and fan of Ronald Reagan, then you wish, oh gosh, I wish we could add him in for three or four terms. And vice versa, if you're on the other side of the political aisle, that you wish that our current administration would go on and on forever. But uh, when your party isn't in power, you're very thankful that there's a uh, two-term uh, limit. And uh, it was a good ruling that they uh, came to, and I'm, I'm glad to know that we uh, uh, continue on as we do right now with only two uh, terms. And then in 1955, the first oil drill, sea growing rig, was put into service. So uh, it was just, you know, not that many years ago that we actually started uh, drilling for oil. And uh, then we came uh, in 1989, just about 40 years later, 44 years later, um, the Exxon Valdez spilled 240,000 barrels, 11 million gallons of oil, into Alaska's Prince William Sound after it ran aground. So within uh, just 50, uh, 55 years or 45 years of, um, 44 years, I mean, my math isn't very good today. Anyway, uh, getting these uh, oil drig drilling rigs out in the ocean, uh, we have a giant calamity. And of course we had one off the coast not uh, two years ago, I believe, which caused a lot of uh, trouble for the, uh, uh, the Florida and Alabama and Mississippi, but uh, things are kind of back to normal and we don't have to worry about that as much. But um, anyway, that's this day in history, something I like to do to keep people uh, aware of what's going on in the world and how it ties in sometimes to uh, biblical matters. But uh, today's sermon, as I said, is Genesis 29, verses 1 through 14. And this will take about 45 minutes to get through as normal. Um, I'll try to speak a little quicker just so that you're all not getting rained on too much and none of you go home with the sniffles. But uh, let me read you the text before we get started. This is Genesis 29. So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and saw a well in the field, and behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it, for out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now while I'm reading this, I want you to ask yourself, why are these verses in here? Because they all point to something much greater than uh, the story itself. And uh, why are certain people named? Why are certain places named, but not others? And uh, just kind of keep that in mind. Verse four, and Jacob said to them, uh, my brethren, where are you from? And they said, we are from Haran. Then he said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, we know him. So he said to them, is he well? And they said, he is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Then he said, look, it is still high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. What are the sheep and go and feed them? But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we, what are the sheep? Now, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Verse 11, then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father, then it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a full month. The stories about Jacob here contain pictures within pictures. We've already seen that about six times with him. As always, Bible stories are meant to show us what really happened, but also what will happen. Eventually, though, everything points to Jesus and our relationship with him. The life and record of Jacob and those he interacts with here is no different. So let us keep our hearts and our minds open to the wonders ahead. Today, we leave the land of promise and we head to the land of the people of the East. And that leads us to our text verse for today, which comes from the book of Hosea chapter two. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice 
In loving kindness and mercy, I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. God promised to betroth a people to himself forever. Now, as believers in Jesus Christ, we become a part of that relationship with him. It's a relationship pictured in a meeting at a well in an open field many thousands of years ago. And so may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. I have three thoughts for you today. The first is flocks by a well. This is verse one. So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. Now in this verse, of this first verse of chapter 29, there's a happiness which is in the Hebrew, which is seen in almost none of our translations. In fact, the only translation I found with it is Young's literal translation, which is an old translation, kind of an old English. And it says there, lifted Jacob his feet and came to the sons of the east. It, were, it was as if he were skipping at the prospects of his journey after having received the assurances of God at Bethel. You remember he went to Bethel, he's sleeping out in the open, he sees the vision of the ladder, God makes promises to him, and he says, I will surely bring you back to this land, and he gives him these sure promises, and so Jacob is, he's like skipping up on his journey to find a wife. Within this one verse that we just read from last week's sermon is a distance of 400 miles of which nothing is mentioned. And that should tell you, as God chooses select things out of the Bible, he's saying, pay attention to this. The rest of what happened to Jacob or Rachel or Abraham doesn't matter. Focus on the things that I am telling you because it's going to give you pictures of other things. However, beginning with this verse here is a picture of the people of Israel during their time of exile from the land. In the story of his time away, there's gonna be other pictures too, and we're gonna see some of them today. But Jacob's entire time out of the land of Canaan paints a very broad tapestry of Israel's exile from the land twice in their history. The first was in when they were exiled to Babylon for 70 years, which is recorded in the Bible. And the second was the Roman dispersion or the diaspora, which occurred in AD 70 and which was completed on 14 March of 1948. Uh, I'm sorry, 14 May of 1948. In the story of his time away, there are going to be these pictures. Now, the first one that we see here is he is outside of the land of blessing. In Genesis 26, God told this to Isaac. He told him to dwell in the land and that he would bless him. The implication is that when he's not in the land, he or his seed after him, that they'll be out of the uh, promised blessing. In Deuteronomy 28, verse 64, God promised that disobedient Israel would be scattered among the nations away from their homeland. The next point is that he is without an altar. At no time during his travels while he's up in Haran for those 20 years is it recorded that he built any altar at all. And this is true with Israel during her dispersion as well. Hosea 3 verses 4 and 5 tell, tell us this. It says there, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king or a prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. During the entire time of exile, there have been no proper sacrifices to God. Despite being protected as a people, the spiritual connection with the temple worship has been lacking, just as no altar is recorded during Jacob's time away. Not only is he going to be out of the land of promise, and not only is he going to be without an altar, but he will be in a land of foreign gods. This is going to be seen when he goes to his uh, uncle Laban's house, who is a man with household gods in his own home. And this is Israel to a T as they've been dispersed around the world. They're in lands of foreign gods. Along with that, he is going to gain an evil reputation. While he's away, he's going to have Laban's sons accuse him of stealing all of their wealth. It says there in Genesis 31 verse 1, which we'll get to in a few more sermons, now Jacob heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's, and from what was our father's he has acquired all of this wealth. Likewise, Israel during both of her dispersions received evil reputations, such as during the book of Esther, which is recorded from the first exile, and of course Israel's second dispersion, they've been moved time and time again around the world as people accuse them of stealing their wealth. It ultimately ended in the Holocaust in Germany. And we see it continuing even in America today. 
If you go on any conspiracy website, I don't care what you go to, they are eventually going to find the Jews to blame. They're going to say that they're the ones that destroyed the uh, Twin Towers, and they're the ones that are ruling the government and doing all these things, and they get this evil reputation. And it is very sad about this, that what is going on, because these people are diligent and they're hardworking people. And they want peace wherever they are. But through God's blessings and through their diligent and hard work, people see that they're gaining this wealth and they think it must be because of, you know, being cheaters or stealers. And that is not at all the case. God is ever faithful to his unfaithful people. They reap the shame and they reap the punishment from the seeds of disobedience that they sow. But God will never forsake them. And these are just a few of the patterns between Jacob and Israel when they're outside of the covenant land which God has given to them. All right, we'll go on to verse 2. And he looked and saw a well in the field, and behold, there were three flocks of sheep by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now, as we're reading this, once again, pay attention and think, why? Why three flocks? Why does it mention that the flocks are in a field? Why is there a well? All of these things have significance. And God is trying to get us to not just read these stories and say, oh, that's a beautiful story about how a guy finds a wife. There is more involved in it than that. So pay attention. However, this is not the same well where Abraham's servant met Jacob's uh, mother, Rebecca. If you remember that story from many uh, sermons ago, uh, Abraham sent his servant to find a wife for his son Isaac, okay? And they went up to a well. This is not the same well that they're at. That well was close enough to the house to carry a jar of water for the use by the family. And the description of the two is different in how the water is obtained from the well. Once again, it's very important. This is a well which is out in an open field, which is used by shepherds specifically for their flocks. When he came to it, it says that there are three flocks at the well, but there was a large stone covering it. And so they're just sitting there waiting to water their flocks. This then, what it is, is it's a spring well which flows underground and there's a fracture in the earth and the water bubbles up to the surface. Because of shifting sands and maybe because of evaporation, there would have been a large stone placed over the top of this well. And then in that large stone, there would be a hole cut in the middle of it. And then that would form the cistern's mouth. And on top of that hole, they'd take this big heavy stone and they'd roll it on top of there. By placing the stone on top of the mouth, the pressure of that stone would keep the water from coming up and evaporating, okay? The water then is very precious, and the well is considered common property for all of the shepherds, as we're going to see in the next verse, verse 3. Now the flocks would be gathered there, and they would well the stone from the well's, uh, they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. The term that was used to describe in the, the uh, uh, previous verse, this very large stone, has no definite article in front of it. And this is an important thing to consider. In the Hebrew, it doesn't say the stone. There's no definite article. And that means that it would not take every shepherd to move it. One shepherd could move this stone, but rather not all shepherds could move it. This, in other words, this shows that there was some type of an agreement between all of the people that no one would water their flock until everyone came together. Until everyone else was there, they would sit and they would wait for the others. Once everyone showed up, the top would be popped and the water would bubble out so that the flocks would come up and lap it up. Is anyone here seeing a picture of anything yet? That's my question for you. Verse four, and Jacob said to them, my brethren, where are you from? And they said, we are from Haran. Here we have this friendly greeting from Jacob. He's in a foreign land and he certainly doesn't want to appear like a stranger. And so he calls the shepherds his brothers and then he asks where they're from. The language that they would speak here in Haran would be different than the land in Canaan. But his mother is from here and he would have learned the language from his mother. So he certainly would understand them even if he had a little bit of an accent. Any difficulty between the two languages though would be resolved by Deborah, who is Rebecca's wet nurse who traveled along with Jacob up there. She's from this area and so she could take care of any translational problems that they would have had, but there probably wouldn't have been any. Their answer to him must have been a very welcome answer. We are from Haran. He is going off to the land of Haran to find a wife, and this is where those shepherds are from. Now, he could still be a very long distance from Haran, 
And the reason why is if you've ever been to the Middle East, you'll see that these people will actually travel miles and miles and miles away from where they live just looking for good pasture. In the Bible, you'll see stories of people that travel, I mean, half of Israel just with their flocks. They like adventure. They like to just see new things. And so they take their flocks and they wander around. But he is now among people who are friendly. They are close to his family and they probably know his family personally. Verse five, then he said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, we know him. Laban is actually the grandson of Nahor. And so you have to ask yourself once again, why would he ask it this way? Why is God recording it? Are you Laban, the son of Nahor, instead of Laban, the son of Bethuel? Laban's father is Bethuel, but Nahor is probably better known than Bethuel, or Bethuel may have died. For whatever reason, he now asks about Laban in conjunction with Nahor, and that becomes important in what we're gonna talk about later. They answer knowingly. And that brings us to our second thought today, which is introducing Rachel, or we would say Rachel. Verse six, so he said to them, is he well? And they said, he is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Jacob's question about Laban is an Eastern way of inquiry. He would have said, Hashalom lo, is there peace to him? Now, when he says this, the word peace or shalom in Hebrew is more than just a state of calm or, or kind of something we uh, look at in the 60s as peace, baby. It's, it's a lot more than that. It's an entire concept of the wellness and the prosperity of the person. It is contentment and it is blessing. And that's what he's asking about. Is he well? Is there peace to him? And their answer confirms to him that he does have this. They say, shalom, he is well. And as what seems to happen, time and time and time again in the Bible, God intervenes immediately with something new in which proves that things occur by more than happenstance. No sooner did Jacob ask about Laban than the people say, yeah, we know him, he's doing well. And by the way, here comes his daughter, Rachel. Were we not to have ever read this story before, and some of you may not have heard the story, we could safely guess that this girl is someday going to be Jacob's wife. This is the way God works. He introduces people that become relevant to the story immediately. He was sent out of this, his homeland to find a wife from his family. He arrives at a well where there are people that know the family that he's looking for. Then a daughter of that family just happens up at that moment. God's hand and his timing are all over the story and it shows he is in complete control of what's happening. And that right there ought to take, uh, we ought to take pause and have each one of you think about your own lives and about the things that happen in your lives and you wonder, why is this happening? I, I won't identify the person, but somebody here has emailed me several times this week with a lot of troubles and a lot of trials in their life. And I keep reassuring them, God is in control of what's happening. He knows these things. He is attentive to every single detail. If he's giving us stories and details that show this minute care of his people as it leads to Jesus, how much more does he care about us? I shouldn't say how much more, but how much then can be we reassured that he cares about us in our own station now that we are in Jesus Christ, having called on him as our Lord and Savior. So understand that the tense nature of our life and the trials and the troubles that come are there for a reason. And God is using them to mold us into the image and conform us to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So stand on that and be reassured in it. Rachel here, she's the daughter of Laban. She comes with her sheep. And as we're gonna see, she is a shepherdess and she is going to become one of the four mothers of the children of Israel. Eventually, she's going to bear two children of her own. She's gonna bear Joseph and Benjamin. Both of those sons in future sermons you're going, going to see will prefigure Jesus Christ. Joseph is going to be the one to receive the birthright of his father, and one of his sons, Ephraim, is going to inherit the preeminent blessing. That'll be uh, many years from now towards the end of Genesis. From her son, Benjamin, is going to come Saul, the first king of Israel, and also another Saul, whose name was later changed to Paul, and he became the author of much of the New Testament. Her name means you as in a lamb. And this young shepherdess is obviously a most important figure in the pages of the Bible. Verse seven, then he said, look, it is still high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. Jacob is himself a shepherd. We know this, he's 
been a shepherd down in the land, the promised land of Israel. And so he knows what is right and what is normal for attending sheep. But he doesn't know the customs of this well. And so he gives them this friendly advice without understanding why they're just sitting around and doing nothing. Normally, what will happen with these shepherds is in the middle of the day when it's the hottest, they'll go and sit under shade and they'll let the flock sit by the water and they'll lap up the water and uh, they'll just kind of gather together and take it easy. And that kind of reminds us of the 23rd Psalm where it says, he leads me by still waters. This is the picture that we're getting here. These guys are kind of lazing around and the, the sheep are by the still waters. But once that part of the day is over and it starts to cool down again, the animals would be taken back out in the field to eat more. And this is now the time of day that that should be occurring. And he is not understanding why are these guys just sitting around and so he tells them, look, the, the sun is still high in the sky and you need to get the animals watered and get them back out and eating. They're not going to get big and they're not going to get fat and they're not going to get yummy standing around looking at each other. But without taking any, taking any offense at what he is trying to tell them, they explain to him why they're sitting by this well. And that brings us to verse 8. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth then we water the sheep. There's a local agreement, and it is only when the flocks are gathered together that they will roll the stone from the well's mouth. If they had already watered their sheep and left, then when Rachel shows up, she won't be able to move the stone by herself, okay? Or any other young, small, old, any shepherd that isn't physically capable of moving this stone is going to have their flocks and they're not gonna be able to water them. So only when they're all together are they gonna water the sheep. In other words, here's what they're saying. Today we are waiting on her. We're waiting on Rachel. Verse 9. Now while she was still speaking with them, he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. There are all kinds of speculations as to why Rachel is the shepherdess of the family. I guarantee you that God orchestrated it for a reason, and you're going to see why in a little while. But people comment, why is Rachel the shepherdess? We know from the Bible that Laban has two other sons, or at least other sons, and it's, so it's possible that at this time, they're too young to tend to the sheep. Leah's the oldest possibly, Rachel's next, and then they have two younger sons. There's an older daughter named Leah, and she isn't taking care of them either, and we don't know why, but it's possible because the Bible says her eyes are weak. And if her eyes are weak, it could be that the sun, she may have blue eyes instead of uh, browner eyes, which would kind of keep her uh, able to be out in the, uh, uh, the elements and the bright sun, okay? Or it could be that her eyes are weak physically. She can't see well. And if that's the case, then the little lambs are going to run away and she's not going to be able to go and find them. So whatever the reason is, God ensured that the Rachel, the lamb, that's the meaning of her name, would be the one that would come to meet Jacob. Verse 10, and it came to pass when Jacob saw the daughter of uh, Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Ra Laban, his mother's brother. It says it three times in one sentence, his mother's brother. It's very important. There was probably, though, a lot of emotion in Jacob right at this moment. He had left his home at a very great age. If you were at the uh, previous sermons, you know that he wasn't a young boy when he left. He's 77 years old, and he has probably never been away from his home for more than just a very short time with his own flocks out in the fields. He goes on this long journey to find a wife. He arrives at a well where his cousin is coming in to water the sheep. And she is, as we're going to learn, very beautiful. All of this and more surely had him overwhelmed. And so in a display of his care for the family, and probably in order to impress Rachel, he moves this great stone all by himself off of the, uh, off of the other stone, the uh, covering stone, and he waters the flocks for her. He is a man looking for a wife, and Rachel is a beauty that will suit his needs. Verse 11, then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. This is the second time in the Bible that a kiss is noted. Okay, the first was when Jacob deceived his father and obtained the blessing and he kissed his father at that time. Now the one who is blessed kisses his cousin and his future wife. Then he lifted up his voice. Doesn't say what, but it could be he's praising God. Maybe he's in triumph over the long journey or maybe in elation over meeting this beautiful young Rachel. 
for whatever reason, the emotions that went along with this voice resulted in weeping. Verse 12, and Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father. Depending on what translation you use here, it will say Jacob told her that he was her father's relative, her father's kinsman, her father's brother, etc. The Hebrew says that he is her father's brother. And this might seem confusing, but it is not meant in a literal sense. Brother in the Bible is often extended to remote degrees of family, perhaps a nephew, a cousin, an uncle, etc. And I bring this up as I do from time to time to show you that using different translations and different translators will attempt to explain things differently and it can lead us to wrong interpretations about what's going on. And this is why I believe that it is best to use different translations in order to get a fuller understanding of what is being said and why. In fact, uh, Paul has been to many of my Bible uh, classes in the past and I tell people, please bring whatever version you have because it gives us a chance to talk about why things are different in these uh, particular uh, uh, passages. Anyway, as soon as she hears who he is, she runs off to tell her father, and she certainly leaves the flocks in his care. And that brings us to our third and final thought today. And when I say that, it's not a very uh, short thought, and it's gonna sound like I'm done and I'm not gonna be done, so don't get all excited about jumping up and leaving. It's, it's interesting stuff that's coming. Our third thought today is welcome in a foreign land. Verse 13, then it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran out to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So he told Laban all these things. Laban certainly remembers many years ago, it's almost a hundred years later now, the 10 camel, camels that are full of goods that bore Abraham's servant when he came to find a wife for Isaac and turned out to be Laban's sister, Rebecca. He probably knows that through communicating with Rebecca, you know, there's caravans that go along this entire area through Canaan down to Egypt, and they probably sent mail that way. So through communications with Rebecca, she has uh, certainly told Laban that Isaac has become great, he's prospered greatly, and that the blessing is now going to flow down to the sons. He may not know which son at this point, but he does know that there's a lot of prospering going on in the land of Canaan. Laban, as we saw, is a worldly guy. And as we saw before, he is also a family guy. And so he is going to take these two concepts, being worldly and being a family guy, and he's gonna get them merged so that he is going to be blessed as well as taking care of his sister's son. And so just as he did almost 100 years earlier, he runs out to meet a visitor at a well. That's what it says in Genesis 24, verse 29, if you remember. Now, Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban, and Laban ran out to the man by the well. Once again, Laban runs out to a man by a well to become a part of God's word and the story of mankind moving from the fall all the way to its restoration in Jesus Christ. There at the well, Laban embraces Jacob and for the third time in the Bible, it notes a kiss. And that's important because Jacob deceived his father with a kiss and now Laban is going to be deceiving Jacob and he initiates his contact with him with a kiss. So he kisses him, he brings him to his house where Jacob tells him all about his journey and maybe why he left in the first place. You know, I deceived my father and my brother wants to kill me and I gotta get away. We don't know, but you know, they're having a little conversation there. Verse 14, and Laban said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. While in the house here, Laban has a chance to discern the truth of what Jacob is saying. He had no idea that this is really Jacob unless as I said, Deborah went with Jacob and that probably would have confirmed it to him. But at least now they can talk the matter through and he knows for certain that these things are true. In finding this out, he acknowledges that Jacob is his bone and his flesh. And that is a very important term that he uses here. So I want you to try to think where else you've heard that in the Bible. This means that they are of the same family. They are the same stock of people. Because of this, Jacob is now allowed to stay and participate in the family life. This ending verse today tells us that he stayed there for a month, which is literally a month of days, or from one time of the moon cycle until the next. And this is where we end our verses today in order to pick up in a new portion of Jacob's adventure next week. However, as I said earlier, 
Jacob's time out of the land of Canaan is a picture of Israel's time out of their land during the exile. While they're out, and for those who are still out, they are often greeted as family and they're welcome in the lands that they stay. We see this throughout history if you study the history of the Jewish people. But through diligence, through God's blessing, and being a tightly knit family of people, they eventually become alienated from the people that they live with and this has caused them to be moved out time and time and time again. A people ever in search of their own place. This is going to happen to Jacob. It has happened to Israel, but God has kept them as a family throughout the ages, and he always keeps their land open and waiting for them. Jacob is going to spend many long years away from home, but he will return just as God promised. And though Israel was dispersed for 2,000 years, God has favored them once again with their own land. The book of Amos tells us the very last words of the book of Amos that they will never be uprooted from their land again. And it's signed with a very important signature, says the Lord your God. Israel is in the land and they are there forever. And Christ is going to return to his people and he's gonna rule there for a thousand years during the millennial reign in the midst of his people Israel. The times are coming to their fulfillment and God's blessing is upon his people. I tell you what, it is the wise and it is the prudent soul who prays for these people and whose heart blesses them. God has his eyes and his heart upon them and we should as well. Now that we've looked at the historical and the cultural details of today's story, what we need to do is attempt to figure out why are these verses here? Why are all of these details included? Does anybody here have a clue why God gave us this? I gotta tell you something. I had no idea at all until I typed up the sermon. I always do it on a Monday. And on Monday night, I went to bed and I was praying to the Lord, why are these verses in here? I've got no commentaries which give me any hint of Christ and yet I know it just, it just, it, he's all over it. And I was praying to him and it just, it suddenly came to me in the middle of the night. Jacob, as we've seen, is a picture of Jesus Christ. In verse one, he travels out of the promised land to the people of the East. This is a picture of Jesus leaving heaven. It's the last place that he was at in the promised land. As I said, there's 400 miles of distance and the only thing that it mentions is he leaves Bethel and he goes to the people of the East. Bethel, Beit El, the house of God, is a picture of heaven. He travels to the East, which is a picture of the world of fallen man. Adam, when he was uh, sent out of Eden, was sent East. Israel, when they are sent out of the promised land, they're sent to Babylon, which is East. It's a picture of the fallen state of man. In verse two, he comes to a field. This is a picture of the world from which man derives his sustenance. All right, these flocks are pictures of people out there in the field and man gets his sustenance from the ground. We find that in Genesis three, verse 17. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. There in the field are three flocks. God is very specific when he includes a number. He wants us to pay attention to why that number is in there. And this is where I realized what God was telling us. These three flocks are waiting to be watered. It's a picture of the three groups of people that are mentioned in the book of Acts. The Jews are mentioned in chapter two, waiting to receive the Holy Spirit. The Samaritans or the Jew Gentile mix are in chapter eight of the book of Acts. And then in chapter 10 are the Gentiles. All are needing the water of life, just as the flocks here are needing water from this well. The number three in the Bible stands for that which is solid, that which is real, that which is substantial, that which is complete, or that which is entire. Three things especially stamp the number of completeness. For example, God's attributes are three. He's omnipresent, he's omniscient, and he's omnipotent. His essence is, in, is revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are three great divisions of time past, present, and future. There are three persons in grammar which express and which include all of the relationships of mankind, me, you, and us. Thought, word, and deed complete the sum of human capability. We could go on and on with example from the Bible and also from creation itself, but the three flocks are the complete sum of humanity, Jew, Jew-Gentile mix, and Gentile. In verse three, we see that the water cannot be accessed until all the shepherds and their flocks are gathered together. The water is a picture of the Holy Spirit and the stone needs to be rolled out of the way 
before this water can be received. Does anybody see where this is going? In verse four, Jacob asked the shepherds where they're from. Their answer is that they are from Haran. Haran means mountainous. And it is the shepherds who lead the flocks. It is the message that they are taking of Jesus, which according to Isaiah is proclaimed from the mountains. The mountains are the places in the Bible where God often is sought, either rightly or wrongly. So here we have a picture of the people of the world seeking after religion and being led by shepherds. In verse five, Jacob asks for Laban, the son of Nahor, and it skips over Bethuel. He wants to know his condition and he wants to know if he's well. Laban, as explained many, many sermons ago, means white or brick. Bricks, when they are fired, turn white. And so you see the connection there. Jacob is asking about Laban. As a brick, he is hardened clay. He's a picture of fallen man. Nahor, his grandfather, but the one who's being asked for, is a picture of man thirsting for the water of life. A root of his name, almost identical to his name, is used in Psalm 69, verse three, in this way. It says, I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. The word dry there, or parched, is the same basic word as his name, Nahor. Laban, the dried brick and the son of the parched man, is someone who needs the water of life to be quenched. He's a picture of fallen man. In verse six, Rachel, meaning you, a lamb, shows up. Rachel is exactly the same word used to describe Jesus in Isaiah 53, verse seven. It says there, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep, a Rachel, before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And Rachel is leading her flocks to the water. Are we starting to see it? This makes a fourth flock at the well. The number four is the number of things that have a beginning, things that are made of material things and of matter itself. It is the number of material completeness. The fourth day of Genesis saw the material creation finished, and so it represents the earth. Four is the number of the great earth elements, earth, air, fire, and water. There are four directions of the earth, north, south, east, and west. There are four divisions of the day, morning, noon, evening, and midnight in the Bible. There are four seasons, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. We could go on with these, but you get the picture there. Here is the lamb leading the water, the flocks to the water. These are those who already know the Lord, but there are those from the other three flocks, Jew, Jew Gentile, and Gentile that are waiting to receive him too. They are at the well to receive the water. In verse seven, Jacob tells the other shepherds that they need to get busy, water the flocks and get back out in the fields. It's still high day. The work ends at nighttime, not in the day. And this is seen from Jesus' own mouth in John chapter nine, where it says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But there's a problem. They tell Jacob, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth to water the sheep. Are you seeing it? In verse nine, Rachel brings her father's sheep. These are the believing Jews who have waited on their Messiah. Think of the 120 that are waiting on the day of Pentecost to receive the Holy Spirit. In verse 10, Jacob sees her. And then it specifically mentions twice the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother. And then it mentions the sheep of Laban her mother's brother. They are fallen sons of Adam, but they are his kin, the leaders and people who have waited so long for Jesus Christ. When Jacob sees them, he rolled the great stone from the well's mouth to water the flock. This is a picture <sighs> coming next week of the great stone which Jesus rolled away from the mouth of the tomb, thus allowing for the Holy Spirit. The water of life, it is the restoration of life lost at the fall of man. Just as John said in chapter seven of the book that he wrote, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. He had to go into the tomb 
before the stone could be rolled back and the water could be received. You can see the symbolism going right through the Bible, right through this story, right up until verse 14 when Laban says, surely you are my bone and my flesh. This takes us right back to the idea that Jesus came from man, but he did not inherit man's sin. He was born of a woman, but not of a man. In Genesis 2, verse 23, we read this. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Adam received a wife taken from man, just as Jesus Christ's bride will receive a husband born of a woman. Jesus Christ really came in the form of a man to redeem fallen man. For those who call on Jesus from any group of people on the earth, they will receive the promised Holy Spirit and they will be led to li living waters. The stone is Christ. The water is the Holy Spirit which issues from Christ. The well is the spirit of Christ where it dwells. Jacob pictures Christ. The Rachel, the lamb pictures Christ. Everything here points to fallen man and his encounter with Jesus Christ. And you too can encounter him. If you are here today and you've never called on the name of Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, I wanna to explain to you just two more minutes how that can happen. The Bible says that we are fallen. All of these pictures, we see them sermon after sermon after sermon. God is trying to tell us, you're a fallen man. You have sin in your life. Adam sinned and you inherited it. Anybody here with a child knows that they don't have to teach their child to do wrong. It's inherent in them. You have to teach them how to do right. We inherited this sin and we cannot go back before Adam and undo what he did. And we've also added on our own sins in our own life. And because we're in time and we're going this way, we can't go back and undo what we've done. But God is outside of time. He created time so that we can have a relationship with him. And he did something at the very beginning. He gave man free will. And man f exercised that free will in rebellion to God. And God in his divine mercy didn't destroy man at that moment, but he devised a plan in his mind from the creation of the world where Jesus Christ would go to the cross and he would step out of that eternal state and he would bear the sins of man that are committed in finite time. A finite sin committed against an infinite God infinitely separates you from your creator. But Jesus Christ can overcome that. He is fully man and he is fully God and he can take his human hand and he can put it on you and he can take his divine hand and he can put it on his heavenly father and he can be the bridge back to restoration. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. We are all going to die because of sin, but more importantly than that, we are spiritually dead already because of that sin. But the gift of God, it says, is eternal life through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God gives us a gift in the person of Jesus. And he says, if you just call in the name of him, if you call him Lord, you take yourself out of the equation and say, I can't do it, but I know he can, and he did, then you will be saved. He wants us to believe that he really went to the grave to pay our sin debt, and that he really came out of the grave to prove that he was without sin, because it says in the Bible in the Acts chapter two, that it was impossible for death to hold him. Why? Because he never sinned, and the proof is in the resurrection. And next week, we're gonna be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That'll be our sermon next week. It's Revelation 1, verses 17 and 18, the keys of Hades and death. And we're gonna speak about Jesus Christ in detail and his work on our behalf. But if you've never accepted this today, you don't need to do anything special. You just bow your head and ask him to forgive you of your sins. Lay your sins at the cross of Calvary and he will grant you eternal life and you can never lose that. The book of Ephesians in the first chapter, the 13th and 14th verse says that you believe, you receive. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God and God doesn't make mistakes. If he seals you with the Holy Spirit, that is an eternal salvation. You can never lose it. You're gonna mess up. You're gonna make mistakes. You may even go back to your old sins, but God will never forget the faith that you exercised in Jesus Christ. So please make that commitment today because as I said earlier, 300 people died on the Eurydice and off they went. And you may get out on the midnight pass today and off you go. And you will, whatever your last breath is, that is what it will be between you and God, either restored through Jesus Christ or fallen in Adam. Please make the right choice and call on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I skipped my closing verse for today and I wanna to read that to you. It's uh, from Revelation 7, 16 and 17. Tell me this doesn't match what we've just looked at from the book of Revelation, how it so beautifully mirrors the book of Genesis. 
They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. What a great God. One more thing I do every single week. We've almost got a whole poem out of the book of Genesis. I take the verses that we analyze and uh, I uh, turn them into a poem. And I've done this now for 67 sermons and uh, today is no different. This is called Water from a Well. So Jacob went on his journey away from his home and he came to the people of the east to their land. And he looked and saw in a well a field where he did roam. And behold, three flocks of sheep guarded by the shepherd's hand. A large stone was on the mouth of the well now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they would roll the stone away after a spell, and water the sheep and put the stone back with care. And Jacob said to them, My brethren, where are you from? And in response they said, From Haran, we do come. Then he said to them, Do you know Laban, son of Nahor? They said, We know him, indeed we do. So he said to them, Is he well? Can you tell me more? And they said, He is well. Yes, it's true. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Then he said, Look, it's still high day. It's not time for the cattle to be gathered, for them to sleep. Water the sheep and go feed them, okay? But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep, not just whenever. You must not be from around here. Are you from the south? Now while he was still speaking with them in his address, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his uncle as well, that he rolled the stone from the well without another. And he watered Laban's flock with which Rachel kept. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was his, her father's kin and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father about him, certainly all the things that he'd done. Then it came to pass when Laban heard the report that Jacob's sister's son that he ran to meet him, his curiosity stirred, and embraced him and kissed him there under the sun. And he brought him to his house, yes, into his home. So he told Laban all the things which did arise. And Laban said to him, surely you are my flesh and my bone. And he stayed with him for a month under eastern skies. As with Jacob, so did Israel leave the land. Twice in their history, there, this came to pass for them, having been under the judge's divine hand. But in faithfulness, he returned them home again. Yes, God is faithful to his covenant and to his word, and in faithfulness he keeps his people near. In truth and surety he deals, he is the faithful Lord. And so be not downcast, instead be of good cheer. He will guide his people home, none will he lose. In his mighty grasp are we, when his son Jesus we choose. Stand on his promises and give him glory and praise and rest in his goodness for eternal days. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful story of what Jesus did for us. He went to the grave and he came out of it. He rolled the stone away all by himself, him and no other, to lead us to pass of eternal life and the gift of the Holy Spirit and the water which does last forever. Thank you, O oh God, for Jesus. Thank you that he did this on our behalf and that we are restored to you through him. Thank you for the beautiful story of these people that you actually used, that really lived their lives in a way that you could weave it together into this beautiful picture. And in all things, let us give you the praise, the glory, the honor, and the majesty that you will alone are due because of what you've done for us, O oh, great God. And it's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, we do pray. Amen.